and we're going to start off by talking about circuit elements. We're getting into DC circuits here, and your lab today is uh, will be on series and parallel circuits. So the first thing is that we have a, uh, a symbolic language, sort of, for, for circuits. When we draw circuits, we have symbols that we use that represent different elements in the circuits. So one of the important elements is the power source. So we have DC power supplies. DC stands for direct current. That means that the voltage never changes. It produces a constant source of potential difference and the current is steady and always moving in the same direction in the circuit. We also have alternating current circuits, like when you plug something into the wall, that's an AC circuit, an alternating current, and the voltage is changing like a sine wave. So we have AC and we have DC. So our DC looks like a, um, like this, or Sometimes we get lazy and we only draw one set like that. Those are parallel lines. That's like a battery. A DC power supply is like a battery. So one side is at higher potential than the other side. The long line represents the higher potential side. Sometimes we'll put a little plus on that side and a minus on that side, just like your battery is marked with a plus and a minus. The high side is positive. The long line on our symbol indicates the higher voltage side. And an AC power supply, because it's typically changing like a sine wave, that's the symbol we usually use. Now we have <clears throat> resistors. You're going to use resistors in today's lab. Uh, resistors. And we our symbol is just this sawtooth symbol like that, electrical resistance. And then we have uh, capacitors. You won't use those today, but you will next week, I believe. And so a capacitor is typically a very common configuration for a capacitor is two parallel plates separated by a small gap. And so because that's a very common configuration for a capacitor, that's what our symbol for a capacitor looks like. So a battery, you may have noticed up here, uh, when you draw it, when you draw it out with two, sort of the double symbol, it's very clearly a battery. When you draw it like this, and you're a little messy like I sometimes am or you're rushing you know to get something drawn it starts to look a lot like a capacitor you know it's a little hard to tell them a difference to tell the difference sometimes so be careful in your circuit drawings that you can tell the difference between a battery DC ba power supply or a battery and a capacitor and then there are other symbols diodes and inductors and things like that that we'll learn as we go along but I think this is a good start we uh, want to hook up sometimes more than one resistor at a time. Uh, so let's take a look. One way we might be able to do that is to hook them up in series. So we'd have a power supply here, a DC power supply. We'll make it DC for now. And then we'd have one item, one resistor. I'll call that R1 and then maybe a second resistor, R2, and then maybe a third resistor. So this is one way we might be able to hook up multiple resistors in one circuit. Now what your job today is to uh, take a look at this circuit, analyze it, see some of the properties of the circuit. So the Voltage source, I'm going to call that uh, delta V battery. <clears throat> the, 
the voltage source puts puts out a certain maintains I should say it maintains a certain potential difference across the leads of the battery and current starts to flow and the battery or our power supply strives to maintain a constant potential difference so it flows whatever current it needs to to maintain that constant potential difference now in the real world of course batteries and power supplies can't always flow enough current to keep up to, to maintain that power to that uh, delta V especially if the uh, resistance is, is too small but uh, but that's what they try to do all right so as we look at the circuit there are a few things you're going to measure the first thing is that uh, we want to measure the potential difference across each of our devices. So you're going to reach in here with a voltmeter and you'll measure the voltage across R1. And then you're going to move over and measure the voltage on R2. The voltage difference, the potential difference across R2. And then you'll measure R3. And then you'll measure the battery. And then you'll measure the current going into R1 and the current going into R2 and the current going into R3 and the current going into the battery. So those are the measurements you're going to take. And from those measurements, yeah, V1, we can call them V1, V2, V3, and V battery, I1, I2, I3, and I battery, right, current, we use I for current. <clears throat> So once you have those measurements, there are a few things we want you to verify. So one of them is properties of our series circuit. And that is that the current, remember current is a physical thing. It's electrons. Electrons are, are objects with mass. And when a certain number of electrons go into a resistor, the same number have to come out the other side, right? And if there are no branches, if there are no forks in the road, all the electrons have to maintain the same path, right? If there's a split, if there's a fork in the road, some electrons can take one path, some can take another path. But uh, in this case, there aren't any. So what we're hoping that you see is that the current through resistor 1 is equal to the current through resistor 2, is equal to the current through 3, is equal to the current into the battery. And the potential differences should add up. Okay, so potential differences are kind of like, uh, and a circuit, are kind of like going on a hiking trail. So. The battery, when you start out at the low voltage end of the battery, you go through the battery, that's like uh, taking a lift to the top of a mountain. And then coming down is like going through the different resistors. So each one of these uh, resistors, there's going to be a change in potential going through it. So when we add them up, When we add up the total potential drop across all of those, it has to equal what we're applying to. It has to equal delta V battery. Now we're going to look at each individual resistor. So Ohm's law tells us that the change in voltage across a resistor is the current through the resistor times the resistance. So that's true for any given resistor. So the delta V across resistor 1 has to be the current through resistor 1 times the value of the resistance for 1, right? And for 2, the same equation should work. And for 3, That should also hold, right? V equals IR for any of these resistors. So these are five equations. There's two more. 
So we're gonna have a total of seven equations that you're gonna verify with your numbers. So you're gonna take the voltage, right? The potential difference across every device, R1, R2, R3 in the battery. You're gonna measure the current into every device, R1, R2, R3 in the battery. And from those eight measurements, you're gonna verify these seven equations. Uh, <clears throat> so I have five of them here so far. So the next thing, the, the other two are related to um, how do these resistors sort of combine? How, if, if, if you wanted to create this circuit and you looked into your drawer of resistors and you started fumbling around and you didn't have R1, R2, and R3, you had some other values, which one would you pick that would be equivalent to these three as far as the battery is concerned? The battery wouldn't be able to tell the difference between these three hooked up in series or that one equivalent resistor you're going to put in there. They would flow the same current through the circuit. So we want to find that equivalent resistor. And that means that the delta V for the battery would be equal to the I through the battery, right, times the equivalent resistance in the circuit. So the question is, what is that equivalent resistance? Well, think about resistance as, uh, you know, any kind of resistance, something that's slowing you down from walking down the hallway. You're walking down the hallway, you come to a door, you have to stop, get out your key, unlock it, open the door, walk through. You walk down the hallway a little bit more, boom, you give door number two. You have to get out a key, unlock the door, push it open, walk through. That resists you moving down the hallway. You go down to the hallway a little more, you get to door number three, you have to do it again, right? These, each one of these little resistances is slowing you down from getting out of the building, right? Every time you move down the hallway, you've got to stop. It slows you down. So if you, um, if you just come to one big door, right, and have to get out 10 keys and unlock 10 locks before you go through, it might be the same thing as coming up to three individual doors, right? One big resistance is slows you down about the same amount as three small resistances do as you move down the hallway, right? So it's the same with current in a circuit. We can just add these up. As, you, as the current moves through the circuit, if it hits R1 and then R2 and then R3 and then goes back to the battery, it's the same thing the current says. This is the same thing as if I just hit one really big resistor that's equal to the sum of R1 plus R2 and R3, uh, and then I go back to the battery. So R equivalent is going to be R1 plus R2 plus R3. And if there were more, it would be, right, I could add up more here, but we only have three. We do not need to calculate uncertainty um, because we're, we're using a, uh, a simulated lab here. So I believe the numbers come out very, very close. There may be some rounding errors. They may not be exactly uh, the same. But these seven equations are what you're going to verify. So you're going to measure four currents and four voltages, right? Four currents and four potential differences. And you're going to verify, you're going to go through and, and just show that each of these is true. Now these two, you kind of combine to show that they work together. Okay. So series circuits have some issues. You don't always want to hook things up in series. Um, one problem with a series circuit is that uh, uh, the, uh, if one of these elements goes out, then it breaks the circuit, right? Let's say these are light bulbs, old fashioned light bulbs, incandescent light bulbs. And so uh, it's said that old Christmas tree lights, so you have a whole long string of lights, were, used to be wired in series. Well, what happens if you have a bunch of lights wired in series 
This is the first light bulb. This is the second one. This is the third one, right? There's, you have maybe, I don't know, 50 or 100 of them. And one of them burns out. Then it becomes an open circuit, right? Because what is a light bulb? A light bulb, something like this, right? It's a metal, it's a metal filament. And when you run current through that metal filament, it heats up. Why does it heat up? Because the charge, the electrons start to move, right? And they collide with the atoms and molecules that make up the wire. So we, we set up an electric field. When you turn on the power in your, in your house or something like that, you, uh, you set up an electric field in the wire and the electron starts to move. And then it collides with something that makes up the wire, the, uh, the metal uh, atoms that make up the wire. And maybe it bounces back this way a little bit. And then it says, whoa, whoa, whoa the catches itself, right? And the electric field is pushing in it. So it starts to move again in the direction of the electric field. And then it collides with something and it bounces back and then it starts to move again and it collides with something. And so it has a lot of this back and forth. A lot of this back and forth motion, but overall the electron moves that direction, right? But every time the electron collides with an atom or molecule that makes up the metal wire, it gives it a little energy, right? And what does temperature tell us? It tells us how much the atoms and molecules in a substance are vibrating. Every substance that's above absolute zero, the atoms and molecules are vibrating. Even in a solid metal that's hard and brittle, the atoms and molecules are still vibrating a little bit. And temperature tells us how much. So as the electrons bang into those atoms and molecules and get them vibrating more and more and more, it means they're getting hotter and hotter and hotter. And so that's what happens to the wire. We flow current through a wire and, and this is what causes resistance. It's the, the collisions the electrons have with the atoms and molecules that make up the wire. If we could eliminate those collisions, we'd have zero resistance. The, the electrons could move right through without any resistance at all. Resistance is, is like friction for the electron, right? So sliding something across the floor, you know, what do you wanna do? You wanna get the floor as low friction as possible if you're gonna slide a bunch of stuff across your floor. Same thing with your wires. If you're gonna run current through a wire, you wanna pick wire that has very low resistance. Um, and we do have, the ability to make zero resistance wires, we'll talk about that more when we get there, superconductors. So you see here, we've got this model now, we can kind of imagine why we have resistance in, in wires and things, it's these collisions, and when the collisions take place, the energy is getting added to that wire and that wire heats up. Well, the filament in a light bulb is designed to have some resistance so that it does heat up. You want that to heat up, that's how it makes light. It gets so hot, it gives off light. Everything gives off electromagnetic radiation that's above absolute zero. So you and I glow in the infrared part of the spectrum. We can't see that with our eyes, right? They're not tuned to the infrared part of the spectrum, but the military has those night vision goggles they put on, they can see uh, they would be able to see us at night or in a dark room. Now, as you warm something up even more, it starts to glow and give off a little bit of visible light. Well, what's the lowest energy visible light? Red. So it starts to give off some red light. So when you're heating up the coals, uh, you know, in your charcoal, they'll start to glow red hot when they're, as they heat up. Well, when they get hotter than that, they start to give off all the colors of visible light and all the colors of visible light combine to make white light. So they glow white hot eventually. Those coals in your barbecue, when they're really hot, they're glowing white hot. 
And if you could get them even hotter, they'd start to look blue. At night, go out and look at the stars on a clear night. Some stars look white. They're about the same temperature as our star, as the sun. They give off about the same color light as our star. But some look red. They're cooler than our star. They're cooler than the sun. They give off more red light. And some look blue. They're hotter than the sun. They give off more blue light. So check that out. So this filament is just a piece of wire. It's glowing red hot. It's glowing white hot. It's giving off white light. And if it blows, if it burns out, the filament breaks. And so, uh, so we no longer have a path, right? If that burns out, that filament breaks. Right? It looks like this now. And there's no, there's an open circuit here. There's no path no path for the current to go. So what happens? All the lights go out on your Christmas tree lights, right? If one burns out and they're all wired in series, one burns out, they all go out. Good luck finding the, the one that's burned out, right? You have to go replace every one of them and see which one the light come back on. So that's one reason why you might not want series, uh, series circuit. Another one, let's think about what happens uh, in your, uh, at home when you plug devices in, right? So let's say, uh, let's say our first device is, um, is an espresso machine. And then you have your uh, toaster. And then maybe, uh, I don't know, a blender in your kitchen. Well, if they were wired in series, first of all, what would happen if they weren't all on? If one of them is turned off, then nothing would work, right? In order to make espresso, you'd have to turn your toaster on and turn your blender on, right? It, it doesn't really make sense for how you, how you would work with these things. And the other big problem, even if you did turn them all on, the manufacturer has to know what voltage is going to be applied to their device so they can make it operate properly, right? The, the pump in the espresso machine, the heating element in the espresso machine, all of those things are designed to work properly when they're given a certain potential difference. So if you hook them up like this, and uh, in my kitchen, maybe the toaster and the blender are a little different than in your kitchen. Or maybe I don't have a toaster, but I have a microwave, which, which uses power differently than a toaster. So my espresso machine might have a different delta V on it than yours, and, and none of them would work properly, right? So what does a manufacturer do? They design them to work on a certain uh, potential difference, and we hook them up in parallel. We have a different way of hooking things up. Right? This is a, not going to work for us. So here's our power source, right? Our battery or our, the wall, the outlet in the wall. <clears throat> and we hook up a device to it, an espresso machine. Speaking of espresso machines, I'm getting thirsty. Okay. Um, and so now this device is getting the whole voltage of the battery, right? Delta V battery. Now, let's say I hook up another device to it, a toaster. Now, this device also has the whole voltage of the battery on it. So both of these devices are operating on the voltage that's coming out of your wall. And I've drawn it as a battery here, but of course, if it was a toaster and a whatever, a blender, it would be the, what's coming out of the wall, right? So both are seeing the same potential difference. And what's different is as soon as I hook up the second device, the wall has to supply more current, right? It's supplying current to two things instead of one now. 
but it maintains the same potential difference. And if I hook up a third uh, uh, device, then the battery or the wall would have to supply even more current, but all three would have the same potential difference. So I like to get out my, uh, my highlighters and colored pencils. And if we have our, if we call this uh, zero volts, the low voltage end of our battery, if we call that zero volts, these wires, these conductors are like uh, equipotential surfaces, right? So everywhere on that wire, because the wires have no resistance, these are ideal wires, no resistance, everywhere along there is zero volts. I can call that zero volts. And if this is a, uh, I don't know, a nine volt battery, then this, if we go in the low side of the battery here, and we come out the high side, we have to be nine volts higher than whatever we went in at. So I'm gonna call that, I'll use my blue highlighter. So all of that comes out to be nine volts. So you can see every one of these resistors has a nine volt difference across it. Let's go back and look at the previous one series and we'll do the same thing here so if if this is a zero volts i'm going to mark it zero volts in my green pen and i have a nine volt battery that's nine volts i'll get my blue highlighter this is nine volts, but that's only good up to a resistor. The current moving through a resistor tells me that there's a voltage difference, right? This is our equation, V equals IR for a resistor. So if there's current passing through a resistor, there's gotta be a voltage drop across it. So this is gonna be a different voltage here, right? This is gonna be, I'll use uh, yellow. This is gonna be some other voltage. And then this is gonna be uh, an even different voltage, right? I'll use red. So uh, we'll call this um, V2 and uh, V1, right? We don't know what those are. So we, we would have to figure those out, but we would know, um, we'll come back and look at an example there in a minute. Okay, so let's take a, let's finish talking about our parallel circuits. So I'm just gonna copy these because we're gonna do the same thing, but there's some differences now. So I'm gonna copy this and I'm gonna move down parallel. Now, some of these equations are gonna change. So for parallel, you're gonna do the same thing you did for series. You're gonna measure the voltage across R1, right? The potential difference, R1, R2, R3, and the battery. You're gonna measure the current into R1, the current into R2, the current into R3, the current into the battery. So those are your eight measurements. And from those eight measurements, you're gonna verify seven equations. So these first two aren't, are gonna be different. Let me erase the signs here. So for the current, what's going to happen? All the current that comes out of the battery, it comes along I, I guess I should put a I'll put a B there, I battery. It comes along and it comes to this junction right here. This is a fork in the road and part of it says, oh, I can go through R1 to get to the other side and part of it goes straight. So we have current coming down through here. We'll call that I1. And then we, some of the current continues on and it gets to this junction, right? That's another fork in the road. Some says, oh, I can go through R2 to get to the other side. So that's I2. And some continues this way and that's I3, right? 
then it joins back up together and goes back into the battery. So I1 plus I2 plus I3 is going to equal I battery for a parallel circuit. The currents will not be equal if those R's are different. And you want your R's to be different. Okay. And then for the voltage, we already discussed voltage, right? Those are all going to be the same. So the, the voltage is the same across each one of the devices in parallel. Then you're going to get to each of the individual resistors and say, I'm going to verify Ohm's law, V equals IR for each of these individual resistors. So the voltage difference across R1 is going to equal the current through R1 times the resistance of R1. And I'll do the same calculation for V2 and V3. Then you're going to say, well, you know, sometimes I'm making a circuit. I don't have these exact resistance values in my drawer. What do I do? I want one equivalent resistor that, as far as the battery is concerned, looks identical to these three in parallel. What value do I put there? So the battery, as far as the battery is concerned, it's going to flow the same current through that equivalent resistor that it's flowing through these three in parallel. But this is not going to be the equation. We calculate it differently. So let's think about this for a second. These resistors are, are like, uh, there's lots of analogies here, like going to the supermarket, right, and getting to the checkout. That checkout is a resistance to you getting out of the supermarket. So you're only buying two items. What do you do? You go up to the line that has the, the express line. Um, but there's already 10 people in line at the express line. So you look over to the other lines to see, is, 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 should I jump to one of the other lines? And there's only one person in line next to you, but they've got a cart full of stuff, a fist full of coupons and a checkbook. And you're like, oh man, uh, what do I do? What do I do? And you, you got to make a decision, right? So you pick one and you go with it. Well, that's what the electrons do when they get to these resistors. The, the electrons want to take the path of least resistance. If R1 is equal to 10 ohms, and R2 is 20 ohms, and R3 is 30 ohms, the electrons would want to take the path of 10 ohms. And so most of them would try to go that way. But eventually they say, you know what? It's going to be quicker for me to get to the other side to go one of the other paths because all these other electrons beat me to it here. So some go to the 20 and some go to the 30. The more go, more electrons are going to go through the path of least resistance. So the most, the biggest current here, if this is, if this is 10, 20, and 30 ohms, I1 would be the biggest current, I2 would be in between, and I3 would be the smallest current. Now, as I said, as long as there's some resistance in every path, some current takes every path. <clears throat> but if we add a zero resistance path here, if we put if I connect this with the zero resistance path, then all of the current takes the path of zero resistance and no current goes through any of those. That's called a short. So we say these other resistors are shorted out. There's a short here in the circuit, a zero resistance path that all the current will take that path. But as long as there's some resistance in every path, some current takes every path. So how do we find, how do we find that equivalent resistance value? Well, let's think about this one more time. We've got, we've got a, a one resistor there. That's like you going to the supermarket and you're going to get out and there's only one check stand open, right? It doesn't matter what the resistance is of that check stand. There's only one open. And then they open a second one. 
next to it, right? In parallel to it. So what happens? Half the people in front of you run to that other line and your line just got shorter, right? So the resistance for you to get out of the supermarket just got smaller. We added a resistance, but because we added it in parallel, we are creating another path for you to get out of that store, right? We're creating another path for the electrons to get from the positive terminal of the battery to the negative terminal of the battery. So we're actually making it easier for the electrons to get there. We add another one. We've made it even easier. We've added another path. So as you add resistors in parallel, the overall resistance has to get smaller. So the equivalent resistance here, let's say, let's look at my example here where I had 10, 20, and 30. The equivalent resistance has to be less than 10 because if I only had the 10 ohm resistor there, the resistance would be 10. If I add the 20, it has to go down a little bit. It has to be a little less than 10. If I add the 30, it has to go down a little bit more. Again, a little less than 10. So I know that the overall resistance in my circuit has to be less than the smallest one in parallel. And this is the formula we use. And again, if you had more of them, you would just keep adding them here, but we only have three. Okay, so you, you will verify these seven equations. There's also a couple of graphs you'll make uh, in this lab, and then you'll verify these seven equations for a series circuit, and then you'll verify them for a parallel circuit. So let's take a quick look at the series circuit one more time. If I have, uh, I'll just redraw it down here. If this is uh, 9 volts, well, let me make it 6 volts. That way I can do the math in my head. And this is uh, 1 ohm, 2 ohms, 3 ohms. That's an omega. There we go. Then let's go through and, and figure out what the voltage is at every point in our circuit. So this, we could uh, come up with an equivalent circuit. This is equivalent to this circuit. So the current is going to be the same in both of these. And what would our equivalent equal? This is a series circuit, so we add them up, right? 1 plus 2 plus 3, 6 ohms. So I know that V equals IR for a resistor, and I know that this resistor has 6 volts across it and it's six ohms. So what's the current flowing? One amp. So I figured out from my equivalent circuit, I could figure out what the current is. And then I can go back and say, well, as far as the battery is concerned, it's flowing the same current in my series circuit. So this current has to equal one amp. So now I can go through and I can figure out what everything is. I'm going to define zero to be the, the negative terminal on my battery. That means that all of this is zero. <clears throat> That's an equipotential surface. And my high side of the battery is uh, six volts, right? 
So I'm going to use my blue highlighter. That's all six volts right there. Now the question is, what are these other things? So if I hook up my voltmeter here, what's it going to measure? So that voltmeter has to measure the current through the resistor times the resistance. So the current is one and the resistance is one. So I'm going to measure a delta V across that resistor. These are going to be, I'm just going to put ones there. The delta V has to be one volt. That means the terminal on one side has to be one volt higher than the terminal on the left side. Well, the terminal on the left is six volts. So the terminal on the right has to be one volt less than that, it has to be five volts. So I'll use, uh, this is all gonna be five volts. And then I'll hook up my, I'll hook up my voltmeter, I'll call that V1. I'll hook up V2 over here. And V2 has to be the current times the resistance. We know the current is one and the resistance is two ohms. So this is gonna be two volts. So the delta V has to be two volts. Well, the left side is hooked up to five volts. So the right side has to be two volts less than that, has to be three volts, right? And then you could do the do it one more time. And you would see that delta V of across resistor three is the current through resistor three times the resistance. The current is one, the resistance is three, so we get three volts. And what do we get? The left side is hooked up to three. The right side is hooked up to zero. So it checks. Everything's good. All right. In each case, we're doing the current through the resistor. Current through the resistor times the resistance of that resistor. And because they're in series, the current is the same for every one of them. One amp. So here I had one times one, gave me one. Here I had one times two, gave me two. And for R3, I had one times three, gave me three volts. Current's the same through all of these. The only thing that's changing is the R value. Okay. Yeah, let me do one calculation here real quick with the units there a little more clearly. Delta V3 is I3 R3. I3 is one amp. R3 is three ohms. And we get tired of writing amp ohms all the time, so that's volts, three volts. Yeah, these are deltas, these are changes. So one side of the resistor has to be for V, for what did I get for three? Three volts. One side has to be three volts higher than the other side. So that's why it just gives you the change in voltage across each one. Uh, here's what the lab uh, looks like. Uh, so if you were doing it live in person in a lab room. Uh, this is what your bench top would look like. You'd have a breadboard and a, uh, this is our old uh, multimeter. And of course we have those smaller DMMs now that we use. Uh, and that's a DC power supply. So you're gonna do it uh, using the circuit construction kit, the DC virtual lab. So there's a link there to the FET simulation. FET stands for physics education technology 
and that's the University of Colorado uh, has those on their website. It started out as physics, and now they've expanded. There's a lot of chemistry and other things there too, I think, math and some other things. But they're, um, the circuit ones are awesome. I highly recommend you're, you know, you're being forced today, today or this week to, to get familiar with it, but it's really handy to throw. It's so quick. You're going to get so quick at building a circuit. And when you're doing circuit problems later on, you'll see that maybe you do a problem in the book you don't have the answer to. You could very quickly construct the circuit in this, uh, in this simulator and see if your answers are correct. So, uh, so you're going to construct. So I made some screenshots here. So this is what it's going to look like. You've got uh, your voltmeter and your uh, ammeter. You can select them on the left, on the right side there, and uh, you're going to do a few things and make a graph or two. <clears throat> so this this walks you through what you're going to do in lab, and then uh, it gets a little more complicated. And then you're going to do what we talked about today. You're going to set up three resistors in series. And here are some links to some video instructions for how to do those measurements. Because it's very important when you're measuring something in parallel, it should be, uh, when you're measuring voltage, it has to be in parallel, right? Uh, let's go back and look at our, our rules one more time. Uh, when you're measuring something in series, what's the same? The current is the same for every device in series. So if you want to measure the current through a device with your DMM set to ammeter, right? You're measuring current. How would you hook up your DMM in series with what you're measuring the current in, right? Because in series, we know the current is the same through the DMM and through the device. Now, when you do that, Well, let's, let's go parallel here real quick. What's the same in parallel? Delta V. So when you're measuring the voltage across some resistor, how would you want to hook up your DMM in parallel? So you know that the voltage that your DMM is reading is the same as the voltage through your resistor because you've got them hooked up in parallel. Now, let's think about this for a second. If I, if I have a simple circuit here, and I want to measure the voltage across this resistor, and so I reach in there with a voltmeter. I reach in here with the voltmeter, right? And I clip it on. So I just changed the circuit a little bit, didn't I? So the voltage through that resistor, right? We know delta V through a resistor is the current through the resistor times the resistance. So I had a certain amount of current coming out of here going through that resistor before I hooked up the voltmeter. Now, if the voltmeter has some resistance less than infinite, some current is going to go this way and some current will go through that resistor but it's going to be less than the amount of current that goes through that resistor before i hook the voltmeter up so i when i hook the voltmeter up to measure the the voltage on that resistor i've changed my circuit a little bit and i'm measuring a smaller value for the resistance when i take the voltmeter out the voltage on that resistance is going to go back up to its original value so we want the internal resistance, we want the resistance of the voltmeter to be as big as possible. If it's ideal, we often use the term ideal, an ideal voltmeter, an ideal ammeter, an ideal battery. So an ideal voltmeter has infinite resistance. That way, no current goes through it. All the current goes through R and you're actually measuring the voltage on the resistor that would be there when we remove the voltmeter. But if we hook this meter up to measure current,
we would want to hook it up. Oops. We would want to hook it up in series because we know when two things are in series, the current has to be the same through both of them. And we also know that the, the current in this circuit can be found from V equals IR, right? The battery voltage is the current times the resistance in the circuit. So if this has some resistance to it, we've changed our circuit and we're going to have less current than when we remove the ammeter. So an ideal ammeter has zero resistance. So a voltmeter Okay, zero resistance. Okay, let's take a look at the simulation uh, real quickly. And then I'll uh, show you a quick video and then we'll, uh, I'll turn you. Okay, so let me find my FET simulation. Uh, physics. Electricity and magnetism. Let me share this with you. Hold on. So this is the one. So I just typed in PHET into the bar here and immediately FET.Colorado.edu popped up and uh, it brought me to the site and I clicked on physics, uh, electricity and magnetism. And there's the construction kit that we want. Okay, so you can start dragging things, moving them around. You can see that the battery and the resistor look like a battery and a resistor that you would see in lab. But if you click on this schematic over here, it changes them to look like what you would see in a circuit diagram. The, the schematic of a circuit diagram changes them. But we'll, I'll just leave it as batteries and resistors. You could also set your wire resistance, your wires to have some resistance and your battery to have some resistance to simulate the real world. We're not going to do that today. Just leave them as ideal. And then you've got your voltmeter you can take out and your ammeter and we can hook these up. So you can see that what I tried to do and, and, and you probably want to do this also is have these look very nice and square like you would draw them in your diagrams, at least for now, while you get the hang of it. Because this, I'll give you an example. <laughs> this, uh, this circuit here, this circuit here is two resistors in parallel. OK. You might not see that right off when you're looking at it. It might be hard to notice that. So draw it. You don't have to draw it that way. Draw it this way. Let's uh, separate all of these. OK, so. Draw it like this. Give yourself some room there so you it's ob oops. It's quick and easy, right? It doesn't take long. There. Now this is looking like a normal circuit that you that we would draw, right? You can see that. So that's all I'm saying is uh, take the time to draw it such that it's meaningful to you. Doesn't take long. Very quick, throw a circuit together, make it look however you want. All right, boom, there we've got a circuit, okay? So uh, play around get to know the, uh, the FET simulator, move things, click on something and break the connection there and 
put your amp meter there, whatever, you know, play around, um, create a short. I know some of the people on uh, the Monday lab wanted to see what happened if they created a short. So they created a short somewhere. You should do that. I'm not going to show you what happens. I'll leave it as a surprise. Okay, so uh, if you make a short here, see what happens. Now, what is um, what's going on here with with the flow? Uh, what's what's flowing here? What is this? Which end of the battery is my higher voltage side? The top of the battery is my high voltage side, right? So if I put this here like this, it's measuring nine volts. The red probe is nine volts higher than the black probe here. So why are the chart why why are these moving this way? Because they are electrons. It's not showing you the flow of current in the circuit. It's showing you the flow of electrons. So current, of course, is the opposite direction of the flow of electrons, of course. So, uh, so current, you'll hear me in the, in the videos you're going to watch, you'll hear me keep saying the current is going this way into R1, into R2, and you've got these little dots moving the other direction. But uh, that's because those dots are electrons, and I'm talking about current flow. All right, so let me just show you one more thing. OK, so you get the idea. Um, you'll watch those later. But uh, so that's the lab for today. I think you had a good introduction to series parallel uh, circuits. And then we um, uh, talked about the FET simulation a little bit. And as you go through the, uh, the lab handout, there are those videos and screenshots along the way to guide you. But the idea is that you want to, let me go back to, uh, The idea is that you want to verify, uh, you do whatever it says in the worksheet. There's a couple of graphs you have to make, and then you've got these, basically these seven equations you're verifying for series and the, same, and the similar seven equations for parallel.